perky now. So good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse and I'm with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I just want to say again, I've been saying this all month long, how thankful I am that all you guys are back in the classroom. Whatever that looks like, staggered starts, uh, half the class, all virtual, whatever. It's so nice that you guys can get back to class and we're excited to have you as we celebrate cool explorers and scientists from around the world. So today, I'm really excited because we've got a, a new person for an organization I've had the chance to partner with a lot over the last few months. The Duke Lemur Center has done, I think, 25 plus broadcasts with us on all kind of topics around lemurs, Madagascar, uh, biodiversity, and more. And today we are joined by Dr. James Herrera, and he is going to talk to us a little bit about something a little unusual for us. So when most of us think biodiversity, we think tropical rainforest, we think beautiful coral reefs, tons of fish. James uh, focuses his attention downwards towards the soil, which underpins human ecosystems, uh, natural ecosystems, and more. So he's going to connect the dots between soil, its importance to biodiversity, lemurs, and a little bit of stuff, how it relates to us. So I'm excited to bring him in, Dr. James Herrera. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. And uh, excited to have you take us away. Hi, Jesse, and hi, everybody joining us virtually. It's a pleasure to be back on Exploring, and especially now that the class is back in session, like Jesse said, it's just, you know, it's, it's awesome to be able to share what DLC is doing with uh, a broader audience. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, hopefully. I think I know how to do this. Um, Half the fun is the waiting with it. There we Let's go. See. Look at that, I can, I, I did it. <laughs> so uh, I'm just gonna introduce a little bit. Like Jesse said, I'm gonna discuss about soils, lemurs, and human health. What on earth could they possibly have in common? And this is, uh, what I'm gonna talk about is recent work that the DLC has been doing, especially in collaboration with the university in the, in the northeastern part of Madagascar called CURSA. And so I want to give credit right off the bat to all the awesome uh, administrators, staff, faculty, students from CURSA who have been really leading the charge, especially this year with the COVID crisis keeping me here in the U.S. So just to give you a brief outline, I am going to start off by talking about soil ecosystems and what do I mean by soil health. Uh, we're going to talk about forest ecosystems and the lemurs, of course. We're at Duke Lemur Center. Uh, Malagasy people, these are the people from Madagascar and their health. And then I'm going to try to make some connections between these and link soil, human, and lemur health together. But to start off, I actually want to try to flip this virtual classroom a little bit and pose a question to you all. When I say biodiversity, what does it mean? What do you all think of? All right, so I'm going to bring in Ms. Hutchinson's class. Uh, so Ms. Hutchinson's class is joining us in uh, Stratford, Ontario. Oh, one of my favorite places in Canada. Uh, so Ms. Hutchinson's group, what do you guys think when you think of biodiversity? Any idea for biodiversity? We're in grade two, three, so that's kind of a big new word for us. <laughs> no problem. Well, you guys think that over, and we'll come to you guys for a different question. We'll go to Ms. Robinson's class, and they are grade six and seven. Ms. Robinson's class, what do you guys think of? Biodiversity, come on, class. Ella? <laughs> come on, Micah? That's all about biodiversity? Oh, come on, living things. <laughs> oh, we're all getting our brains in shape. Still a little sleepy here in Petawawa. If we can come back to this later. Don't worry. See, James, you stumped them all at the beginning. Okay. How about the group? The group? I, think, I think they're more just shy. Yeah. <laughs> We have somebody? Biodiversity. What do you think, guys? All right. I'm going to go ahead. Um, biodiversity is like living things in the soil, maybe? Where are you, Nate? Or, I like it. Biodiversity is um, like the health of plants and stuff. The health of plants, living things. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Miss Kane. All right, James, tell us what it's all about. Well, that was really perfect. It is, that's the, that's the best way to describe it. Living things, all living things, the diversity of life. 
And it's a term that really just fuses the word biological and diversity. So it's all the different kinds of life. And you guys gave some examples, like the life that's in the soil we're going to talk about. And I love that you started there because that's usually not what we think of. Um, but it's generally thought of as the diversity of species, how many different kinds of species there are in a place. You can also think of the genetic diversity within a species and the different kinds of biomes or ecosystems that were, are within a region. So it's very broad. And that was, that was kind of a trick because, you know, you can define it in a lot of ways. Well, generally, when I think of biodiversity, I think of this charismatic megafauna, which means like the big showy stuff, elephants, giraffes, lions out on the savanna, the jungles, lush jungles like in Madagascar, or underwater, of course, those beautiful coral reefs with hundreds, if not thousands of species of coral, sponges, fishes, crustaceans, and the bacteria and stuff we can't even see. But do you ever stop and think about the biodiversity that's in the soil, right? between your, below your feet or in your hands when you're out in the garden. Actually, a handful of soil like that is teeming with life. But let's not start there. Let's start with some more basics. Soil and its most basic structures, uh, we talk a lot about soil horizons. So if you could picture a hillside where there's been some erosion, oops, sorry, where if you're looking at, if you dig down into the soil and get a shovel full, you might see kind of different colors in different layers, like a cake of dirt. The top two horizons, called the O and A, are mostly what we think of as topsoil. That's like the leaf litter that's partially decomposing, that's the organic matter or just the stuff that's breaking down and decomposing, mixing with you know, what we commonly think of as dirt, soil particles, sand, and that, those are the O and A. The E layer is kind of lighter colored, and that's because the small particles, the finer particles, they filter through and they get down lower and that's stuff like clay and nutrients and water that leach down through the soil. And then B and C are mostly like the bedrock, partially broken down rocks and getting all the way down to like whatever is the, what we call a parent rock. That's like the, the, the bedrock underneath. And still thinking about just structurally like the non-living part, we usually categorize soils based on how they're comprised of Oops, sorry, sand, silt, and clay. Those are the principal components. And if you look at this crazy colorful triangle, based on the percentage of each of these elements, we kind of can categorize soils as sandy clay or silty clay loam. Loam is the best combination of all three. It's a nice mix of all three of these. And you can actually test your soils at home. If you take a jar and fill it half with a shovel full of soil and half with water, shake it up really hard, really vigorously, make sure it's all broken down and mixed up well, and then leave it for 24 hours or 48 hours. All those materials are gonna come out of the water and the heavy stuff, the sand, uh, sinks first, and then the silt, and then the clay. And then you can take a ruler and measure and really compare what is the percentage of different soils, uh, particles in your soil, and figure out do we have sandy soil, clay soil, or that nice rich loam. Try it, you know, when you have some free time, if you uh, get as excited about dirt as I do. So starting back in the 1980s and early 19, uh, excuse me, late 1800s and early 1900s, scientists discovered that there's three main elements that are essential to plant growth, N, P, and K. Those stand for nitrogen, which is essential for plant growth, phosphorus, which is the P, which is good and important for flowers, but also roots, and potassium, which is important for roots and overall plant health. And this led scientists to come up with what they called the law of the minimum. They thought that whichever one of these uh, nutrients was the lowest, that's the limiting factor for plant growth. At the same time, the chemical industry was booming and we got really good with chemistry. And they were able to make fertilizers really cheap that are made of whatever the minerals you need, the phosphorus, the nitrogen, or the potassium. And they could just apply this in the soil and the plants would grow better. And it was awesome. You know, yields really increased very fast. But we really didn't know much about the life in the soil and the effect those chemicals have on the living stuff. So I'm going to pose another question to you. And this one's a little bit easier. What lives in the soil? What do you guys think? I'm giving you a couple of hints here, um, but I'm turning it over to you. 
Awesome. So I'll also check in on YouTube if uh, we had some teachers there that paid in some questions for the first question. I'll also go to Miss Sovereign's class first. Miss Sovereign's class is joining us in uh, Luke in Ontario. So Miss Sovereign, for your class, do you guys have any thoughts on what lives in the soil? It looks like we have lots of thoughts. Have lots of thoughts. Okay. Centipedes. 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 Bacteria. 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 Yeah. yeah. Worms, Katie. Nice. Decomposing. Perfect. This is great. So, Miss Dawson, you guys killed it. That's awesome. How about Miss Hutchinson? You got a student like right there. I wanna, I wanna bring them up. They're so cute. Here, Blake. Still, guys. Spiders. Spiders. Oh, they're killing it. My that is the most patriotic shirt I've seen all day. Perfect. So James, we covered so much. Thank you. Sorry, what was the last one they said? Oh, what was the last one you guys said? Did you say it again? Dead Fire plants. What else? Dead plants. Nice. <laughs> Great. You guys hit on some of the, the most major things in the soil. I'm so excited because you're already thinking about the whole soil food web because it's not really a food chain where it's just one eats another, eats another. It's a web where everybody's related. And I love that you said decomposing plants. Uh, both of the classrooms said that. That's, you know, when we think of like the above ground part, we think of the grasses that the browsing animals eat. The grass is like the, the, the primary food source for the food web. Well, underground, it's still plants, but it's decomposing plants. It's the organic matter or the biological stuff breaking down uh, that feeds that whole food web and the bacteria. I love whoever that you said bacteria because, you know, in a single tablespoon of soil, good quality soil, there can be billions of bacterial cells. And those are like the primary consumers of the organic matter. They're fundamental to the soil food chain as well. Fungi, which we're going to talk about in just a second, they need a whole slide to themselves. But you guys said uh, a lot of common ones like the centipedes, the spiders, they're like the top uh, predators in the food chain on, on the food web underground. Earthworms, and I love that you said earthworms. Earthworms get all the credit. You know, they tunnel through the soil, creating spaces for air and water to travel. They eat the dirt basically and poop out nutritious soil for the plants. So they get all the credit, but actually ants, do a much bigger job of tunneling and turning the earth, bringing nutrients from above, above ground, below ground. And in Madagascar, which we're gonna talk about soon, there's actually over a thousand species of ants. So imagine all the work they're doing in the ecosystems. And then of course this supports higher level stuff above ground, like the birds, the early bird catching the worm and shrews and moles. These are little mammals that burrow and eat these kinds of things. So yeah, it's, it's a complex web and there are some, a few things that maybe you haven't heard so much about that I want to give some credit to. This is a nematode. Nematodes are microscopic little worms in the soil that there's good nematodes and bad nematodes. The good ones like this one have this sharp pointy mouth that they use to stab their prey and suck out their juices. So it's a really vicious little predator. But then there's also bad nematodes that use that uh, spiky mouth to pierce into the roots of plants, like our tomato plants, and we don't like them so much. But it turns out that the good nematodes prey on the bad nematodes. So you need this balance of underground biodiversity. And then here comes my favorite part, the fungi. And I can't do it justice, so I'll let uh, this Atlantic piece do the uh, talking. So you can imagine, you know, on your last walk through the forest or maybe even in your own front yard, you saw things like these, these mushrooms. These are what we call the fruiting bodies. The spores come out of these mushrooms and are dispersing to spread the fungus. But the real nuts and bolts of fungi is underground. And as small as these fungi can look, they can be tremendous underground. In fact, the largest living organism ever are mushrooms, fungi. There's one uh, species, the honey fungus, honey, honey mushroom, which uh, the biggest one was over two and a half square miles. And they define it as 
you know, genetically identical cells working together. That's one organism. So think about that. And again, uh, I can't do justice to what's going on with the fungi underground, so I'm going to let the BBC take over. I'm doing two games because the audio is a little off of this. I've linked it into the chat bar for all our teachers and I put it at the bottom. So if anyone wants to watch that again, you can check that out. It's some really, really cool stuff. I'll put it on YouTube and Facebook too for everyone. Oh, yes. Great. Thank thank you for letting me know, Jesse. I'll I'll make sure to take that. So you couldn't hear that at all, or you heard it kind of partially? Very, very briefly on like a little tiny bit on my screen. I don't know for any of our teachers, but anyway, they all have it now and uh, we can make sure people can check that out because it's a really, really cool topic. The Wood Wide Web is one of the coolest things in science in like a decade. So uh, glad you could share it. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just take a pause there and in case, you know, if I, anybody has any questions they want to ask about the soils and this intricate web of life uh, under our feet. Yeah. I Let's do that. So if anyone that has any questions online um, on YouTube, you can let me know. Uh, for groups are asking us to play it again, you can check it out on YouTube after the broadcast. Uh, so we'll take some questions right now. Ms. Hutch, you can class as a student is already right up by the camera. So Ms. Hutch, class. Do you have a question for us? Go for it. Okay, go ahead. Clay. Hi. What about, you want to ask a question? Go ahead, ask it. There's a lot of clay by our school. Cool. That's a clay. Been, mm -hmm. So we've been digging for soil samples, and we're wondering why our, around our school there might be so much clay. Yeah. That, that's awesome. Well, often when there's construction, you know, they have to dig out a lot of the ground to put down the, a firm foundation, and that leads to a lot of gravel and clay being kind of dispersed all around the construction site and then you've got those bulldozers and plows and everything else you've got rolling over it and that really compacts the clay so if you're trying to do some soil samples like right around the building you're probably going to hit a really hard um layer of of, of uh, clay and stay tuned for the next part or towards the end and we'll talk about how you can amend that soil if, if you want to how you can uh, kind of break up all that clay and make it better to garden in yeah Awesome question, guys. I want to stress, too, that soil uh, sifting experiment. I never actually did that in school. Like, I saw the cool triangle chart. I remember that as a kid, but I never got to do that experiment. So if you guys get a chance to do that, that actually does look like a lot of fun. I might do it when we're done. Um, next question is going to do one question for class, and we'll do other rounds when we're at the second part of the broadcast. And this song is Bruce. Uh, come on in. You mute your mic, and you're good to go. In one, how much of the soil? In one hand of soil. Okay, one hand of soil. I like that unit of measure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great question. Uh, it, and the answer, of course, 
you always get this answer from somebody who's, you know, a scientist. It depends. <laughs> it really depends on the kind of soil. You know, if you pick up a handful of really sandy soil, that's a that's a tough environment for soil life because sand drains the water very quickly. It doesn't hold on to a lot of nutrients. So you may only have uh, a few hundred or maybe a few thousand bacterial cells. You may not see any worms or insects, but trust me, there's a lot going on that you can't see. It's microscopic. Then if you get into a really rich, deep soil, like for example, in some of the peat swamps or in deep uh, temperate forests, especially, one handful might be chock full of visible or macro diversity, like the insects, the worms, uh, and it could be dozens of species. Or, and then of course, when it comes to bacteria, thousands of strains that we don't even know what they do. Yeah, awesome question, guys. I wanna to stress too, we got a lot of Ontario classes today, and I don't know if this is still the case in September, but certainly all spring and summer long. If you go out with your parents at night, at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night with a flashlight, and find it really close to the ground, you'll see worms all popping back into their burrow. There are so many worms that you would never expect to be there. It's the coolest thing that I was like doing it as a kid, so check that out. Um, Ms. Robinson's class, uh, do you guys have a question? Come on up. Um, my question is how many species live in the soil? Yeah, how many species total in the whole world? Oh, wow. How about, <laughs> how about I promise to get back to you on that one? I don't know the answer to that one. I'll, I'll try to look it up because that's a really good number to have in case uh, I get that question again. But I'll look up like what's the most diversity we've ever seen in the soil and I'll, I'll get back to Jesse and he can post it to the group. How about that? Yeah, that would be great. We'd love that. One of the things that I like to highlight with biodiversity for students is that it's a field where we don't really know it. Like, we don't even know how much we don't know. Uh, there, there's been estimates on the amount of animal species, just animals, never mind fungi or little bacteria, protozoa, on Earth that range from 2 million to 30 million different species. We've identified about, I think, 1.5 to 2 million now, um, but there's so much more out there. And every time we look, we discover new things. So questions like that are really hard to answer. Uh, but really, really good, and it takes us to, to seek out more knowledge. So, great question, guys. Um, Miss Kay's class, wrap us up for our first round of questions. If you have one for us. All right, we had one question that uh, was was a bit of a joke, but I thought I would share it. So it says <laughs> the one of our students said, "If your tree web is getting hacked, do you need a tree PN?" <laughs> <laughs> That's that is a, that is a funny, jokey way of putting a, a really excellent question, actually. Uh, so for example, if, if we knew that there was like the bad fungus or the bad nematode in our soil that's negatively impacting the forest or our agriculture, you know, do we want to like wage war on it, get some herbicides or pesticides or fungicides, something like that to get rid of them? And, you know, that's kind of been the model for agriculture, industrialized agriculture for, you know, the better part of the 20th century and now into the 21st. But there is actually kind of a, a really strong pushback and a revolution that recognizes how much work all the other beneficial biodiversity, the good fungi, can do to make a balance in that agro ecosystem. And we're actually going to turn to that in just a little bit. Nice. The great round of questions. Uh, James, if you want to dive in with the rest of the presentation, we'll do a second round when you're done. That would be awesome. Yeah. Jesse, uh, just to check, how much time do I have? Um, so we're at 23 we're minutes. Done a round of questions. So if you want to talk for another 10 minutes or so, and then we'll wrap up with a couple rounds of questions, that would be great. All right. Then I'm going to, I'm going to jet through some of these. Sorry, guys. I, I, I you know, I, I didn't plan for such a great conversation actually. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to have that and, and, you know, you'll be able to see this all uh, uh, afterwards as well. So tuning over to lemurs, what does any of this have to do with lemurs? Well, the lemurs are the famous primates of Madagascar. They're also really diverse, about a hundred different species. And they range from the small, uh, smallest lemurs or the mouse lemurs, about the size of the palm of your hand. They're scurrying around at night eating insects and small fruits. You've got medium-sized lemurs, some of them even like tiny pandas eating bamboo, the famous ringtail lemurs, and up to the largest lemur, lemur the injury, uh, about the size of a medium-sized dog. Now, a lot of lemurs eat leaves. They're folivores. And if you've tuned in for any of the other talks, like with uh, Lydia Green from Duke, you learned all about folivores and, and how they make a living just eating leaves. But today I'm gonna to talk about the frugivores, the ones that eat fruits. Uh, more specifically, these adorable lemurs. 
So a lot of the frugivores, when they eat the fruits, they actually swallow the seeds whole. And when they do that, the seeds pass through their stomach and in the acids and get ground up in their bellies. And when they poop it out, they get this little package of fertilizer with them. And the seeds actually grow better if they've been pooped by a lemur than if they haven't been pooped by a lemur. There's actually been research to, to prove this. My, my advisor actually showed this and her students. So it's really fascinating. The lemurs are the farmers of the garden and the gardeners of the forest. Um, we, we wouldn't have the forest probably without them, or at least not the diversity of trees that appear to depend on them for the dispersal. Combined with that, lemurs are threatened with extinction. Uh, that means that in the next hundred years or so, a lot of the lemurs, in fact, 90% of species may go extinct. And that's a threat not only to just biodiversity generally, but the trees that depend on them for the seed dispersal. So what is threatening lemurs? Uh, well, there are a lot of the common themes like poaching, you know, hunting the lemurs, selling them in the pet trade, but the predominant cause is habitat loss. And so I'm just going to, uh, I, I won't be able to do this justice because I want to get to the um, fun things that we're doing in Madagascar. But um, basically, you know, starting in 1950, we have some land cover maps that show the extent of forest in Madagascar. I'm highlighting in red, this is the Saba region where DLC does our projects. And, you know, zooming in there in 1950, and, you know, I should give you a little bit of historical context. Madagascar was a French colony since the late 1800s until 1960. So this picture shows kind of the tail end of the colonial period. And especially in the Saba region, there was a, uh, but, a, you know, across Madagascar, there was a lot of French colonial government policy that really supported clearing forests to grow cash crops. Cash crops are plants that can be sold to make money, but especially things that uh, were desirable abroad, like coffee, chocolate. Chocolate actually comes from the trees, in case you didn't know that. Um, cloves, which is an important spice. And in Madagascar, the number one uh, producer of vanilla, vanilla that's in all your ice creams and things like that, most of it comes from Madagascar. So in this early 20th century, there was a huge push to clear forest to grow these cash crops. And especially here in the Andapa region, where's my mouse? You know, it was mostly surrounded by forests. There were very few people that lived out there. There were people, um, but it was sparsely populated, but French encouraged a lot of agriculture there. And, you know, fast forward to 1970, Madagascar had gotten their independence. They suffered a lot of economical loss and they were also experimenting with communism. And so at this time the Soviet Union was collapsing. And so that was their biggest partner. So there was also a lot of deforestation as people tried to just farm to, to get by during the economic crash. Fast forward to 1990 and 2017, and we see a lot of the deforestation. In fact, 20% of the forest has disappeared in the last 20 years. This is largely due to you know, small holder farmers, people with just two to five acres, farming enough to, to feed their families and also these cash crops. They'll cut uh, a lot of the, the vegetation, like in a forest, and then once the vegetation is dried, they'll burn it. And the burning releases a lot of nutrients in ash and char, which you can see here, and that helps to grow crops. But thinking back to the soil ecosystem, it's also really devastating for the soil ecosystem. It kills off all those earthworms, fungi, you lost your world wood wide web there. And um, so this, this area is very productive at first to grow staple crops like rice, corn, cassava, beans. But over time, we see that this leads to this kind of mosaic landscape with, you know, slash and burn active here, kind of fallow fields. They had a, they had a crop rotation schedule where after growing rice, they might grow beans and then bananas and then leave it for a while to regrow. And you can see up here where there's this tree line, that's actually the boundary of the national park in this area. Where there are no national parks, and this has gone on for hundreds of years, we can really see the effect on the landscape. The, the, the ground just becomes unproductive, can't be farmed anymore, it has to be abandoned. So that leads us to the human health aspects, and uh, uh, this is now turning to issues of malnutrition and food security. And uh, if I had a little more time, and because YouTube isn't working great, I would normally let the FAO tell you all about this, a food and agriculture organization, but I'll share this YouTube video with Jesse so he can share it with everybody so you can learn about the global problems of food security and malnutrition. But let's just fast forward 
um, and you know, uh, thinking about the time. So these are global statistics that they talk about in that video. Uh, stunting is when children are shorter than they should be given their age, and that's because they just haven't had enough nutritious food to grow properly. And we can see the prevalence here across the world, you know, 22% of kids are stunted, and that's way above our goal to get that down to around 12% in the near future, 2030. Anemia, that's when there's not, uh, uh, people don't have enough iron in their blood to support um, you know, you know, strong health and the, uh, keeping oxygen in the body. And it can have a lot of complications, especially for women of reproductive age, because if they're pregnant and they're anemic, it has a lot of negative effects on the baby. Global average of 32%, that's just too high. Our goal is to cut that in half by 2030. Zoom into Madagascar, where there's 26 million people. 80% of those people live in the countryside, rural countryside, and 70% live below the poverty line which is about $2 per day. Uh, for the health statistics, these all, again, come from the Food and Agriculture Organization, 48% of children are considered underweight, uh, and 36% of women are anemic, which is higher than the global average. So these are real health problems that stem from not having enough nutritious food. And so now I'm trying to connect these dots from the poor soil health because of the exhaustive agriculture uh, linked to the low biodiversity that you end up with in those agroecosystems and how that is related to poor human health. And these are all kind of related in a feedback loop that is kind of perpetuating. And so we want to figure out how can we break that feedback loop, improve the soils, bring the bi biodiversity back and improve human health. So that's where agroecology comes in. And I like to think of agroecology as the fusion of farming and natural processes but it also goes beyond that to consider cultural resources and social justice. So I, I don't have, uh, I don't want to uh, take up all the time, but really like the, the trees, especially like we were talking about with those deep roots and associations with fungi, they pull the minerals up out of the soil, put it up into their biomass, their leaves and wood. And when that falls and decomposes, especially we could use it in an agricultural landscape with our corn, cassava, papaya, um, a lot of those plants also need wind protection. Uh, trees like the coffee and the cacao where we get our chocolate need shade. And there's trees that can provide that shade as well as uh, put nitrogen into the soil naturally. You know, banana trees grow very well at the forest edge and they're a staple crop as well. And this encourages the, the beneficial biodiversity that helps the farm, like the birds and the bats that eat the pest insects. And actually, again, ants don't get enough credit at the role they play in controlling pests. So, um, I, you know, I don't want to take a whole lot of time. There's a, there's a lot of different benefits for the farmer as well as the environment. Yeah. And this is how we're applying it in Madagascar. We are, this is one example of a primary school where we're engaging the Parent Teacher Association and doing presentations with uh, and, and training about agroecology. Uh, this is, sorry, I, I jumped forward. This is Christoph Mandari Bay, the director of the university that I was mentioning. He's got a PhD in ecological restoration, but he likes to apply it in agriculture. And this is uh, Michel, uh, who is um, a, a specialist in agroforestry. He's demonstrating at our model nursery how to choose the coffee seedlings that are ready to plant. And uh, we're planting them out with the farmers, with the school. It teaches the children too about the value of these trees. We planted 40 in a model garden at the school and we distributed 400 seedlings to nine participants. The CURSA students are like consulting with the farmers, going out to their fields with them, helping them plant these trees and take care of them. So it's really inspiring. Back in November, 2019, we also started agroecology agro gardens, home gardens. Uh, Terra Firma International uh, partnered with us, Peter Jensen and Lynn Von Norman came out to Madagascar joined the uh, four villages and 30 villagers in each uh, of these uh, locations, and also five students from the university to teach and train about employing um, biodiversity into the garden. And here's Christoph also uh, following up and explaining the value of, of ecology for the garden. We're sharing educational materials to really make it explicit and have it at the model gardens. The students are demonstrating how to make soil food that's going to go on to become the food that feeds the village. Here are the students are working hand in hand with the local community to chop up the browns and collect the kitchen scraps and the char from cooking fires, 
all to make compost. That's how we can bring these soils back to life. And then we use that compost to reinvigorate these soils. So here's one of the villages that's literally on the beach and talking about those sandy soils. We've got to put organic matter back into that soil to bring it to life. And here it is, you know, coconut coir, brown dead leaves that otherwise just were raked up and burned. We're putting them to good use in the soil. We're doing a top dressing here with the ash, the char, all from the cooking fire, not, you know, burning trees in the forest. Eggshells, in fact, provide micronutrients that are essential, these green leaves too. And, you know, nobody's afraid of getting their hands dirty. Really put all that good locally sourced organic material into the soil. Lily's very proud of what they've made here. Um, we designed the garden to try to capture rainwater runoff um, and and really you know maximize the, the resources all around us, making these living fences of wonderful vetiver and lemongrass uh, grasses. We share cropping calendars with the participants. Uh, so traditionally, they had a really um, deep knowledge of crop rotation that we feel like has kind of been lost recently as people focus more on just rice and vanilla. And so we've compiled traditional knowledge with data from the FAO to create these really precise cropping calendars, which spread the harvest across the year and also allowed for diversified income as well. And the farmers, you know, they really appreciated the participants. They all get their starter packs of seeds so they, they can start with green leaves and beans in their own fields. And I just wanna highlight some of the really exceptional participants. This is one of the bean gardens by Dosseline. And what started with a modest one by one square meter plot has now become a one by one by three cubic meter a productive plant that's um, giving Dosleen and her daughter here the beans they're very proud of. It also attracts edible insects like this delicious bug, the sakunji, which believe it or not, tastes like bacon and eggs and is highly nutritious. Stay tuned for more on that soon. <laughs> Madame Angel here, who's uh, demonstrating her uh, you know, amazing skills. I mean, this, this garden was planted in July and we got this update in September. I've never seen corn grow that fast. This is corn in a polyculture with tomatoes and beans. Here's Jeannot, you know, planting his uh, garden, modest at first and then exploding with life, the corn, squash, peanuts, cassava, and even rice without slash and burn and without flooding the fields. So it's really, really inspiring. Some of our participants are doing their own experiments. Here's Jean Marohavana, who's got his corn in the background and his ginger in the front. So ginger is a good cash crop that folks use. Um, and he did an experiment where he plotted half of his land with the traditional method, just tilling and putting the, the ginger in the ground and a smaller portion, half the size, amending it with the compost like we showed. And he actually reported that he got the same yield, 200 kilos from both plots, even though the agroecology plot was half the size. So it's really double the yield. And that's inspiring for his neighbors too, who see him having these awesome yields. Um, the, the folks are also teaching each other. So Donacien, one of the students in between workshops, he goes back to his home village and he teaches his family. And these are his brothers and cousins helping to make a garden in their backyard. So it's really inspiring. And um, the next steps for this project are we're, we're gonna be collaborating with seven new tree nurseries to produce those diverse uh, trees to put back on the landscape. We're gonna be hosting three more agroecology workshops before the end of the year. And we're also integrating agribusiness entrepreneurship with a new collaboration with North Carolina State University. So not only regenerating the soils and growing nutritious food to eat at home, but also to make a profit. So I have to thank the, the team that makes this possible, Charlie Welsh, who's been leading the project since uh, over 30 years and Lantu Anjian Anjasana, our project coordinator, who's been leading all the activities in Madagascar for 10 years. Um, but we've also got some new rock stars in the mix, like uh, Everard here, who's really passionate about the gardens and educating children. Torien, who's been our agricultural uh, you know, leader for, for most of this year. And the Cursa team, these are the faces of folks that are really uh, going to be the future of conservation in Saba. The staff and faculty are amazing, and the students who have been leading the agroecology and the agroforestry, we couldn't do it without you. Um, we, we're also excited that we just got uh, support from two grants to, to support this research and development, the Triangle Center for Evolutionary Medicine and General Mills. So um, thank you very much. And 
This builds on a lot of work that DLC has, has been fortunate to get a lot of grants uh, and of course donations from viewers like you all. So if you like what you see, uh, check us out on lemur.duke.edu and share it with, uh, with all your friends. So thank you all very much and hopefully I left enough time for some questions. Yeah, fantastic, James. If you want to end your screen share so we can have a bit of a conversation and you can see us again, that would be awesome, perfect. Um, and yeah, uh, Laura has been covering it on YouTube. So all our teachers and four different teachers on YouTube have been asking a ton of questions, so welcome into them. Laura, thank you for answering all those questions. Uh, and anyone online can check out Laura's whole high school STEM presentation we just unveiled the other day uh, on Monday, so you can check that out. She's awesome. Some really, really great stuff going on with the Dreamer Center. So I want to take questions from all our classes if we can do this. James, uh, I did not expect going into the talk that we would have a uh, cake of a uh, soil cake and bacon and egg buns, but I appreciate James. <laughs> um, I don't forget to, soil food. Don't forget soil food. You know, one of the things that you highlighted, you actually did two things that I really, really liked, and I want to harp on them before we dive in with Q&A. One was highlighting that it takes a village to do this sort of work, literally and figuratively, and the amount of sponsors, partners, organizations that are coming in to do this is huge. Um, and secondly, that you named all the local collaborators. That's something that I think does not happen in like 99% of our talks. So I really want to stress that you did an amazing job of highlighting local all-stars in Madagascar, amazing people doing amazing work. So thank you for that personally. Um, and the class is hopefully you guys are inspired by that as well. All right, let's go to Ms. Hutchinson's group. If you guys have a question to kick us off, go for it, man. Hi, buddy. Hi. How come you... What does you? How, how come you miss? How come you miss? Um, isn't a kind. Of, how come humus isn't a kind of soil? Oh wow! Well, I was not expecting that. Yeah, humus actually technically is. It's that O horizon. I I, I glossed over it because I didn't think humus was going to be a common vocabulary. I'm excited. You know that one. The humus is that O horizon. That thin top layer at the at the top soil. Just actually just below the topsoil. You know, most people kind of ignore it or group it together with the topsoil, but it's it's really important. And I love that you brought it up because that's the first thing to go in a lot of the agriculture, right? If you go and clear cut the forest, your source of humus is gone. If you till the soil, you basically burn off all that humus and that's where nutrients and the soil life really starts. So thanks for bringing that up, the O horizon. <laughs> Great question, buddy. All right, Miss Kane's group in Southampton, Ontario. You have a question for us? Go for it. All right, quiet class, please. What was it, Simon? <laughs> All right, we were wondering, getting the ash from the crops, is that good or bad? It's, it's good. The ash actually has, I think it's called potash, and it's basically uh, different forms of phosphorus and even some uh, other trace elements that we don't really get from a lot of other sources. So ash is really good, uh, and that's why it's an effective means of farming. You know, the, the swidden or the slash and burn agriculture is effective in the short term. And, in, you know, it, I, in an ideal world where there's lots and lots of forest and and you know, people can leave the land alone for like 10 years before they come back to it, it can work. Um, but unfortunately, you know, there's there's just not that much land. People are reusing the land every two or three years. And so if you think about it, you get less and less ash each time. Now flip that and think about everybody cooking three times a day in their kitchen with charcoal or with firewood. And that's a lot of ash we could be saving and putting into the garden. Awesome. But be careful because it's also very alkaline. It's got a lot of, it's, a, it's like base, you know, so you want a balance of the pH in the soil. If you put too much ash, you'll have a basic soil and you should mix that with something else like coffee. <laughs> Actually, if you have some leftover coffee, that's acidic and that can balance it out and give nitrogen. So We're all the things we have at home. We're Canadians, James. We never have leftover coffee. Don't be sad. <laughs> Me either, but just in case. Robinson's class. And then Ms. Sovereigns to wrap us up to Ms. Robinson's class. If you guys have a question for us, go for it. We're a little shy this morning, but we are wondering how many types of species of lemurs are there in the world? Cool. Whew. Ask, ask five lemurologists and you'll get 10 different answers. Um, you know, lemur, lemur science has really exploded in the last decades because of genetic analyses. And so I think it was even just back in the 90s, we thought there were only 30 or 40 species of lemurs. And then when we started to do careful studies of their genetics, we discovered 
they're actually really diverse. There's probably over 100 species. The last I checked, it was 100, and then recently I saw a report saying 113. So I have to check my own numbers there, but it's somewhere around there. All right, and the freakiest of them all, which I encourage all of you to look up, is the AYE. So A-Y-E, A-Y-E, check out AYEs when you're done the talk and you'll be blown away. Um, let's wrap up with one last question from Ms. Sovereign Clap. If you wanna end us off, uh, go for it. You mute your mic and you're, you're all set. Sorry. Perfect. Go ahead. What is the most endangered type of lemur? Yeah. Did you get that? What is the most endangered? Yeah, most endangered type of lemur. Thanks, guy. Huh. You know, every two years, lemurologists and other primatologists get together and debate that exact question, and it gets heated. I mean, people start throwing tomatoes. No, I'm just kidding. It really is a big debate. There's a conference where everybody gets together and debates about it. The last um, meeting and report from that meeting just came out, and it's really long, and I haven't read it all. So I'm sorry, this might be outdated, but there's a lot of debate. And I'm just gonna give you a couple answers instead of one. So one is the greater bamboo lemur. Um, it was thought that there were maybe only 500 or so left in the wild. Now we've discovered a few more populations, but it's still very threatened. Greater bamboo lemur, exactly. Um, there's also the silky shifaka, which is endemic, meaning it's only found in the Sava region up in the Northeast. And in fact, really only found in Marojeji and Anzanohari Besud, these are two national parks. Um, we just had a team of CURSA students and, and staff teaming with WWF, did some lemur surveys to find those silky shavakas, and they had a lot of difficulty. In fact, you know, a lot of hunting and things are threatening those lemurs. And then what's the other super, super highly uh, threatened one? There's another shavaka called the Tattersall shavak. That one's a tough one to spell, but T-A-T-T-E-R uh, something. <laughs> Propithecus tetrazoli. That one's highly endangered also. So I don't have one answer for you because I'm, I'm out of date with the latest report, but I'll get back to Jesse and let him know which is like the most. Perfect. Thank you so, so much, James. Um, yeah, so if you didn't see the banner with Ted or something, Chewbacca, that's great. <laughs> I'm going to put that up there. Um, this has been great. I um, would love to hear more of your questions. So for our teachers uh, live on YouTube, send me questions. I'll pass them to James. Uh, we're going to inundate him. He keeps volunteering. So it's, it's a huge volunteering. I feel no qualms about that. Um, you guys are a great uh, group of classes today. So thank you so, so much to eight classes, over 150 kids. Across Ontario. Ontario just loves lemurs today, which is awesome and cool. Um, so Dr. Herrera, thank you so, so much for joining us. We really appreciate you being here with us today. It was really my pleasure. And I'm, I'm super excited to hear over 150 students. And wow. it's great to be able to reach you all because I don't get that opportunity. And so, yeah, if, you know, happy to share my email or uh, shoot me a message on Facebook and we can chat more. Awesome. Well, with that, what we do at the end of every broadcast, James, I'm going to demute or bring in all our teachers. So, Miss Kane, Miss Hutchins, Thank you so much, guys. Bye. Bye.